everyone. Welcome to Bethel today. My name is Max Anderson and I'm from Bismarck, North Dakota. I'm also a part of Bethel Church at our Fergus Falls campus, where I'm a part of the worship team, youth group, leadership, and serve as a sound tech. During the school year, I live right across the parking lot where I'm a senior at Hillcrest. I'm here to welcome you today and to share a few opportunities coming up for sharing Jesus with others this Christmas season. If you're in Battle Lake, it's time for Christmas caroling. Bring some Christmas cheer to the residents at Good Samaritan Nursing Home on Sunday, December 17th. Sign up is at the Battle Lake Connection Center starting today. In Fergus Falls, today is the first day of the Foster Closet Giving Tree. Grab a tag off the tree as a guide for giving to foster families in Outer Tail County. You'll find this tree in the atrium in Fergus Falls. And finally, today is the beginning of Advent. Advent is a season that starts on the fourth Sunday before Christmas and ends on Christmas Eve. It's a time of waiting and preparing our hearts for the birth of the Savior of the world. So as we think about how we will celebrate and worship on Christmas, here's what we're planning at Bethel. Our Christmas Eve services are on Sunday, December 24th. In Fergus Falls, we have three worship times, 8.30 a.m., 10.30 a.m., and 4 p.m. In Battle Lake, we will have two services that day at 10.30 a.m. and 4 p.m. Everyone is welcome. As you make your Christmas Eve plans, don't forget to think about who you might invite to worship with you and who might be open to hearing the good news of Jesus at Christmas time. It's Advent. As we worship, we prepare for the coming of Christ. We will be reminded that God sent his son into the world to be our covering, that we are wrapped in the mercy of God through the birth of a child. We will praise God for the birth, life, and death of Jesus, where forgiveness has been fashioned for you and for me. So today we light the first candle on the Advent wreath. This is the prophecy candle. Let's hear about what this means as we prepare to worship our coming King. This is the first Sunday of the season of Advent. Advent is a time of preparation for the coming of Jesus Christ. During Advent, we look back to when he came to earth as a baby. And we look ahead to his second coming as the King. And today, we look to him as he desires to come to each of us as Savior and Lord. The candle we light today is the prophecy candle. It reminds us of the prophets that pointed to the coming of the Messiah, the Savior, Christ Jesus. The Apostle John wrote, the true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. Let, Let us worship, worship him now together. together. Hey everyone, Pastor Dave Foss here. Thanks for connecting with us today at Bethel. It's my prayer that this message be something that God uses in your life in conjunction with you belonging to a local church. We believe that online messages can help fill the gap when worship in your local church just isn't possible on a given weekend. Maybe you're traveling, maybe you got some health stuff going on, whatever the reason, isn't it great that we can connect like this? It is, and we're happy to share this online resource with you to encourage you till you can meet back here with us at Bethel or wherever your faith family is gathering. So again, thanks for connecting with us today and hope to see you soon. Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, good to be with you on this Lord's Day, this first Sunday in Advent. Uh, great to be with you. Those of you joining in Battle Lake, good morning, everybody. Those of you online, welcome. So I'm going to ask you to reach for a Bible. Church, would you do that? Everybody grab a Bible. We're going to turn to Genesis chapter 3 today as, uh, as we begin a, a sermon series uh, leading us forward in Advent. So Genesis chapter 3, and would you stand for the reading of God's Word? Genesis chapter 3. I'll start reading at verse 1. God's word for us says this. Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, We may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, but God did say you must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden, and you must not touch it, or you will die. 
You will not surely die, the serpent said to the woman, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate it. Then the eyes of both of them were opened and they realized they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. This is God's word. Would you, would you pray with me? Um, Lord, thank you for this uh, passage of scripture that takes us all the way back to where everything went wrong on this good planet that you created at the beginning. And uh, Lord, we will find our story in this story and we will see the thread of your redemption uh, pulled through this text. Um, help us now as we commit ourselves to looking to your word and understanding what it teaches us to have our minds open and our hearts open to what you want to share with us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Please, you may be seated. So, uh, so it's, it's Advent, right? Uh, it, and one, one of the lines that we sing this time of the year is this song. Do you know the song? It's beginning to look a lot like Christmas, right? I mean, that's, that's like one of the things we sing. And, and one of the ways that we know it starts to look like Christmas is even by the things that we wear this time of year. Um, you can actually wear Christmas, right? So much of Christmas is about the clothes, whether it's the, the ugly Christmas sweater that you wear to the Christmas party. You got, you got one of those? Did you know it was ugly? <laughs> maybe you got one of those. Uh, maybe it's the outfit that you laid out for the kids for their singing in their Christmas program. Whatever it is, uh, the Christmas story is, can be told by your wardrobe. Uh, now, for some of us, our Christmas fashion is really kind of simple. For some, for some of us, our Christmas fashion is summed up with one word, warm, warm. Like, that's all that counts. That I, I don't care about what it looks like as long as it's warm. I used to care what it clothes look like. Now I just, am I warm? Like, any, amen to that, some of you? Yes, right, just want to stay warm. Now, others, you, you, have, you have a certain look or a certain idea about way, the way you should dress at this time of year. What is your fashion sense? Like, what is your style? I, 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 got, a kick out of, I got a kick out of what one person said. One person said, my fashion philosophy is, if you're not covered in dog hair, your life is empty. Yeah, I love that. I love the dog. That's awesome. Uh, another, another person said, my fashion style is I'll wear what I want, and by that, I mean pajamas. Yes, some of you, like, you would love to just come to church in your PJs if you could, wouldn't you? Okay, so clothing speaks. In fact, your clothing speaks before you do. It's talking before you, you know, it's, it's talking before you're talking. It tells a story. And in the Advent series that we're in, that's called the clothing of the king, the clothing of the king, we're going to see that clothing actually plays a part in the story that the Bible tells us. In fact, just think about it. There are so many references to what people are wearing in the Bible or, or what they're not wearing in, in, in the Bible as well, as we'll, we'll see in our text today. Uh, but this Advent series that we're going to get uh, going in today is based on some material by, by a ministry called 1517. Um, they have some great stuff. I, I recommend you go to their website and check out the things they offer, Bible studies, resources, all kinds of things. Uh, we're going to be drawing from some of their resources and the messages that we'll be preaching in this Advent series, uh, as well as a devotional guide that you can use. Uh, we have a QR code that you can click on and go to get some devotional resources for you in this season of Advent. You can kind of follow along in the, under this theme, the clothing of the king. Okay, we're going to see in this series that even the clothing worn in Scripture points us forward to Jesus Christ. In fact, the storyline of fashion begins early on in the Bible. Well, so how, how, how early does it show up? Right at the beginning. Genesis chapter 3. If you were to put a title over Genesis chapter 3. A title that could be fixed over Genesis 3 would be this, Naked and Afraid. Because that's exactly how we find Adam and Eve in Genesis chapter 3. Notice it again, verse 6 and verse 7. It says that when the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye 
and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. And also she gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate it. Then the eyes of both of them were opened and they realized they were naked. Okay, so you've got, you've got Adam and Eve, right, in the Garden of Eden, and they, I mean, like, they just basically got there. They're kind of not long on the scene, and all of a sudden, they, they seem to sort of suddenly throw everything away that God had created for them. They destroyed the perfect place. This Garden of Delight, that's what Eden means. This, the Garden of Delight was ruined by their, by their believing Satan's tired lies that doing life with God is not necessary. They weren't the first to believe it. They were the first to believe, but they're not the last to believe because we still believe too, don't we, at times? These tired lies of Satan that we're better off out from under God's love and out from under God's leadership. We look at God and say, God, leave us alone. We got this. We got this. But we don't, do we? And they didn't, clearly, because what followed was a tidal wave of divine judgment upon humanity. It was paradise lost, literally paradise lost. Relationship with God lost. And not just for them, but for every person in this line of humanity that would follow, which includes you and me. And so this is what we see. And maybe then, even as you think about that, and you think of your circumstances in your life today, as you, even as you enter into the holiday season, maybe you even start to realize that you're feeling the pain of what was lost in Genesis chapter 3. And if you are feeling that pain, you are feeling that sense of loss, you are not alone. Despite the, the cheery Christmas music that has been playing since before Thanksgiving, the primary emotion that many people feel around this time of year is grief. And maybe it's grief because you have literally lost someone that you loved, maybe a spouse, another loved one. And this is the first Christmas maybe without them with you. And you feel that. Or it could be that you're grieving the financial pressures that you feel encroaching upon you as you feel us turning the corner toward not only just it's the most wonderful time of the year, but it's, it's the most expensive time of the year. And you, you're, just, you're just throttled by, by, by the pressure of financial strain because maybe some bad choices you made, some debt you got into, whatever it may be. And you want to be more generous this Christmas, but you just, you just feel like you can't. And for others, the season brings a keen awareness of relational strain, Right? Uh, there's the, the sibling that you're not speaking to. Uh, there's the kid that's driving you crazy. There's the sister-in-law who's mad at you and you're pretty sure you're not going to get a Christmas card from her this year, right? Or maybe what you're grieving is just this long list of regrets that you carry. Do you know what I mean? The, 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 the regrets of things that, that you should have done. Like, I should have done that, but you didn't do it. Or the things that you did that you wish were, that you could undo, right? We live with these regrets of, I, I should have, or I, I wish I hadn't. And these things weigh on us. And so while, while you are here, and while you maybe are wearing your Christmas smile and your Christmas sweater so well, underneath, you're just naked and afraid. And like the first sinners in Genesis chapter 3, you need to be clothed. So what are you going to do? What's your plan? Well, I, I, I suppose I, I could just cover up with something. I could just cover up with something. And this, this is what we see happening in the text. You notice it? Again, verse 7. It says, when the eyes of both of them were opened, and they realized they were naked, so they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. Right? So I love how the passage says that they, their eyes were opened. So they, they began to see themselves as they actually were. They couldn't pretend anymore. There they were, their eyes opened to their reality. Okay, now when I read this though, does anybody else think fig leaves? Okay, that's a bit odd. Like anybody else like, I don't know that I picked fig leaves to use to cover up. This just seems a little bit weird, but I, gotta, I also think we shouldn't be so hard on them. First of all, that what did they have to work with? I don't even know what they had to work with. Fig leaves seems as logical as anything else. I'll just, I just know this. If you suddenly found yourself naked, wouldn't you just grab anything you could? 
I would, I would, if I, I would hide behind the pulpit. If I, I would use this. I, fig leaves does not seem strange when you realize their eyes are open. They're seeing themselves as naked, and they grab fig leaves, and this is, this is what they do. Uh, one cartoonist had fun with this. I thought this was cute. Take, take a look at this. You know, <laughs> uh, right, so and, anybody else go, like, yeah, everything is traced back to Genesis. A, a lot of people will kind of say, yep, yeah, you know, just look at the things we say and we do in this world today. It all goes back to Genesis, and that's where that question comes from. All right, so what do we have here? What do we have in the text? We have Adam and Eve, their eyes are open to their sin. They're faced with their sin and with their shame, and they cobble together an outfit, a covering for themselves, made of fig leaves. But here's the problem. Our attempts at a cover-up never works. It never actually does the job. We say, we say, I'll hide my shame, I'll hide my sin, I'll hide my faults with this, or with that, or with this over here, or with that over there. We, we have a plan to cover up and to hide what's not flattering about ourselves. But no matter what we use, it just doesn't work. Our our cover-ups are not good enough. They're, they're just absolutely not good enough, no matter what it is. Yes, we need to be clothed. Yes, we need to be covered. But our attempts to cover ourselves are as lame and as silly and as ineffective as fig leaves. So what are you using? Well, what, are you, what are you hiding behind? What is it that you're using to cover up your faults, your sin, your shame? Not, not, maybe nobody else can, but certainly God can see right through it. And in your eyes, you're still just naked and afraid. In the eyes of God, you're still just naked and afraid. You need better than the cover-up you can provide for yourself. So God sees their circumstances for what they are. So what does God do? Does he, uh, does, he, does he mock them, right? Does he, does he laugh at them? No. Does he, does he send them out into the, into the forest or out into the wilderness, cold, exposed, naked, afraid, covered in guilt? No. No, that's not what God does. I love this. Notice it. Later in chapter 3, verse 21, Scripture says this. This is incredible. The Lord God made garments of skin for Adam and his wife and clothed them. Just let that sink in for a minute. God made clothes. God made clothes. God himself, with his, with his own hands, sort of fashioned together a covering for both Adam and Eve. Imagine it. God, with his own like designer label, Making clothes. And his choice of materials is unique as well. It's all his own. He didn't use fig leaves that Adam and Eve used. He didn't whip up a few yards of fabric from some cotton in the garden. No, he worked in leather. God uses skin. And so here's what we see. Though they and all of humanity had been sentenced to death, because that's the result of sin, the wages of sin is death, Scripture teaches, though they and all of humanity had been sentenced to death, the very first to die would not be Adam and Eve, but another in their place. It would be the first time blood would be shed in God's good world. It would be the first time a final breath would be taken in God's good world. It would be the first time a warm and healthy body would grow cold. All to cover the sin and the shame and the embarrassment of two people who didn't want to live under God's love and leadership in the first place. Two people who basically said, God, leave us alone. We got this. We got this. This is what God provides. He provides the covering that they themselves could not provide. Even in their rebellion against him, he loves them like that. See, God's solution is a third party, some truly innocent being losing its life. Now, the, the scripture doesn't tell us what kind of animal this was, only what this animal gave. 
And so now, here's my question for you. Are you, are you starting to see it? Like, are you connecting the dots in this story with the rest of Scripture? Is that working? Is your, is your like, Christian spidey sense beginning to tingle? You're like, oh, yeah. I see, I'm starting to see it. Are the clues starting to come together? Is it coming into focus how this moment points us to King Jesus and, the, and making sense of Christmas, making sense of all of it? Uh, theologians call what we're looking at here in Genesis 3, they call it the proto-evangelion, the proto-evangelion, which is a fancy phrase. It literally means the, the first glimpses, the first view, the first glimpse of the good news of the gospel. This is like the, a first window into kind of like, oh, there it is. Like the rest of the Bible is going to pull this thread and show us what this is all about. What is the good news of the gospel? What is this good news? The good news as we see it here in the text, is that from the very beginning, God has in mind your sin and shame, your shame and mine as well. From the very beginning, he had in mind your vulnerability, the vulnerability that we all feel, the pains and the problems associated with life in this sin-sick world. And God would not be satisfied until all who are naked and afraid are covered. All of us. And so he sent his son into the world to those who, who anticipate his birth in this first advent of, of, of week of advent. He, he sent his son into this world to be our covering. To be the one to give his life so that we could be clothed. This is, this is the story. Why? Because again, God works in flesh and blood. He works through the loss of innocent life, through the shedding of blood, through the letting out of a last breath. That's how God works. So through the extinguishing of a perfect life, forgiveness was fashioned. A garment of forgiveness big enough to cover the sin and shame of the whole world was made. Big enough to cover all your sin and all your shame as well. Isn't that good news? And it's good news for people who know that underneath their Christmas smiles and sweaters, they're just naked and afraid. It's good news that Jesus left heaven to become one of us, that he set aside his royal robes and he took on flesh as a man. And so what we see in Scripture is this. This is so amazing to me. At Jesus' birth, we see our king at first naked and then swaddled in rags. And at his death, we meet our king wearing nothing but our weakness, our shame, our rejection, our mortality, wearing what rightly and only belongs to us. That's what we see. At Christmas, we see a gift exchange like no other. We see that in the life of, and death of Jesus Christ, there is now an outfit, a custom-made outfit made just for you, and it fits. It is for you, made by God for you, to cover you, your sin and your shame. The clothing of the king has become ours, and we then get to rejoice with the words of Isaiah. I love this passage. Church, would you say it with me? Isaiah 61 verse 10, say it with me. I delight greatly in the Lord. My soul rejoices in my God, for he has clothed me with garments of salvation and arrayed me in a robe of his righteousness. Praise the Lord. You are wearing the garments of his salvation. He has made it. He gives it freely to you. This is the season in which we celebrate the fact that God can clothe us with his perfect righteousness. It is his gift to you. And it fits under any ugly Christmas sweater you've got. And it goes great with some new pajamas. And you can get dog hair on it, and it still looks great on you. It's for you. A robe of righteousness. Quit your cover-ups. Just quit your cover-ups. Take his. Take his. The price for you, free of charge. 
cost him everything. But for you, it's free. How do you get it? Well, you know, you just, you say to Jesus what you tell your kids to say this time of year. Yes, please. And thank you. Yes, please, Jesus. Cover me with your robe of righteousness. Cover my sin and my shame. Yes, please. And thank you. Naked and afraid, no more. Thanks be to God. Would you pray with me? Let's pray. Lord, uh, thank you. Merciful God, gracious God, thank you. We are, we are in awe of how the thread of salvation is woven into every page of Scripture. We thank you for the truth revealed here in Genesis 3, where sin entered the world but did not have the final say. We praise you for the incredible sacrifice of Jesus in taking on flesh and blood and then going to the cross in our place. By faith in him, we receive the garment of forgiveness. Thank you. Thank you for the assurance that in Christ, our shame is replaced with honor and our guilt with grace. Lord, I pray for anyone here who may still be carrying the heavy burden of shame or guilt. Lord God, in a special way, come to them. May they find solace in the, in the good news announced today. Would, would you press into all our hearts and minds in understanding that Jesus bore it all so that we might be robed in your righteousness, naked and afraid no more. Lord, thank you. Uh, thank you for offering to cover our sin and shame. And to that offer today, we say, yes, please. Yes, please. And thank you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So now as you go into your week ahead, just remember that God loves you. He gave his life for you. There's nothing you can do about that. There's something you can do with it. You can take the good news of that gospel shared with you today and bring it to the world around you. And as you do that, as you go, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord turn his face toward you and give you his, his grace and his peace. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, amen and amen. God's peace be with you.